In Orkney, we used to have an expression, I'll be hour with the moon, meaning that I will come and visit you when the moon is full to light my way. Well, hello, Rhonda. It's good to be here. Hello, Scott. We're glad to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom? Uh-huh. How are you getting on? All right. <laughs> have we stopped it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, bugger. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can see from the, the highly professional Muir household here, um, here we are again, another month, another full moon, and we're our way it again. Now, the expression, of course, coming hour with the moon meant that in Orkney, that's when you went visiting in the winter when the moon was full and you could find your way to neighbours' houses. But sometimes neighbours fund their way to your house as well. And this time, this month, we have a visitor, <laughs> which a, is great. A frequent visitor. A frequent visitor, yes. aye. But folk listening to this podcast are not going to be aware of this. Well, they see. will be by the end of it, though. Yep. I am just so delighted to have a very, very dear pal of mine here. Um, sorry, what, what was your name? <laughs> <laughs> Scott Gardner. Uh, Scott is one of the greatest, and he will hate me for saying this, but he's one of the greatest bothy ballad singers in Scotland. Wow. And you can tap that as meaning the world. Because this is the home of the Bothy Ballads. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Actually, you may be better explain what a Bothy Ballad is. Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Tom. Uh, so Bothies were, well, there's various sort of uh, understandings of what a Bothy is, you know. It's, I say to most people in modern day Scotland, a Bothy is a, a place you would maybe sleep in when you're out hill walking. You know, that's to most folk, that's what a Bothy would mean. But uh, in in the context of Bothy Ballad, the Bothies were a building on a farm uh, during the the sort of from about the eighteen twenties through to say nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties in some places, and this is where the unmarried farm workers would live. Uh, so it's particularly the 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 farms in. Sort of the mixed farming areas of uh, you know North East Scotland, Aberdeenshire, Kincardine, Angus, down to Fife and Lothians. Uh, I'm not sure would the, the body system have prevailed in Orkney as well, Tom? Would it? Well, when I was uh, <clears throat> when I was young, a long, long time okay. ago, when Victoria was the last, <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, I was working on an archaeological dig, uh, how it's had strumness, and the uh, archaeologists had hired Binscarth Hoos. Okay. And that was the base for, like, the um, the 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 supervisors, the governors, the bosses. They were in the big hoose. The rest okay. of them was in another place. And I was living at home, of course, or you know, whatever I ended up. But the, um, there was a bothy outside the big hoose, and it was just uh-huh. called the bothy. Right. So there was a kind of system like that. Um, because in Sandy, you had like at Worcester, you have the, um, the bow hooses and they were kind of a tied hoose uh, again yeah. to the firm where the firm labourers yeah. would live. And there was just a row of hooses. So you'd had about four families in yeah. that. And it's, there's other areas actually uh, yeah. that had that as well. Like there was one at the stove. And yeah. so, yeah, it was, it was maybe no that common, but it, it certainly it, it, was, uh, uh, was a thing. Uh, but, Aye. So the, the yeah, the crack with Bothy Ballas because the the lads, you know, they're working on a farm very, very long hours, you know, you'd you'd be up at five in the morning to sort of see to your horses and then you would start work start proper work after you'd had your breakfast, maybe about six o'clock. And that would be you through till tea time, you know, five or six at night. And um 
so you you were working a lot of the time and you'd maybe have you know maybe three or four hours before you had to go to your go to your bed so you, by the time you had your tea maybe you got cleaned up and um of course this was before you had electric or much in the way of uh, uh digital entertainment and um a lot of the places that the guys would maybe play play cards or or drafts uh, those kind of kind of board board games or um they would just tell stories sing songs and um a lot of the songs that they sung were very much just about their day-to-day existences and hence they became known as bothy ballads i'm not i'm not sure exactly if, um where the first term is where bothy ballad is first kind of recorded has been a term um but certainly once you went into the 1900s people were speaking about bothy ballads and and songs mm. and uh, so they continue to be sung today obviously the way of life that sort of brought these songs about has changed substantially but there are still people who who sing these songs. I mean, just uh, in is it middle of February, they have a a Bothy Ballad Champion of Champions competition, uh, and there be a full hall in uh, in Elgin in in Murrayshire with mm. maybe about five six hundred people who just come to listen to mm. to Bothy Ballads. That's the weekend in the year that mm. they they do this. And uh, so it's a big thing, then, really. Still, you can. Aye, it is yeah, it's 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 a kind of um, just one of these. You know, every area across the world has their sort of things that are, you know, that is what happens culturally in in whatever place. And I would say northeast of Scotland, Aberdeenshire in particular, is, you know, where where these body ballad singers you know go, mm. and a lot of them are, are from there. I mean, I I would be from. <clears throat> Probably the 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 southernmost bit, really, of the 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 Bothy ballad singing heartland. Um, I guess you could say that myself and Joe Aiken, who's from Kerry Muir, just a few miles up the road from me, we would we would probably be the be the sort of southernmost of the of the real hardcore Bothy mm-hmm. singers. So, what what um, uh, region is that in? For for anybody that doesn't ken where Kerry Muir is. Oh, so Kerry Muir is shame in, on you. By Kerry Muir is in Angus. <clears throat> it's a it's a satellite town of Forfa, mm-hmm. um, and it's about maybe six thousand people. And like most of your Angus towns, it would have been a a market town uh, back mm-hmm. in its day. There's no well, Forfa Forfa's cattle market just closed um, in the sort of middle of last year. So there's there's no longer any agricultural mm-hmm. markets in Angus, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, but these um, these towns would also have what were called fian markets, which was the the driver of the the Bothy system essentially. That <clears throat> every six months, your farm workers would tend to move to another farm, um, and they would do this by going to the fian market, mm. and uh, they they had quite a lot of autonomy, you know. But, but un, unlike certainly in the sort of Previous more kind of feudal era of of farming, you were now at a stage where the guys could just sort of up sticks and they had a chance to negotiate their wages uh, freshly each time. You know, so that was one of the reasons why <clears throat> um, unions never really caught on among the among the farm workers because the the workers were actually able to you know renegotiate. Every and okay, they maybe weren't making a fortune, but but they still had that that bargaining power, yeah. at least on the day itself. You know, there, there was a mm-hmm. kind of. Uh, I heard be. that with uh, with the fian markets, there was a kind of symbols as well that mm-hmm. that um, showed that you were for hire. Yeah, straw or, or yeah, straw and mouth. Yeah, uh, uh-huh. and uh, I think I suppose it would be quite obvious. You know, if if you were there. Um, uh, and you weren't just sort of like slouching at the back. It might have been fairly obvious you were looking. You yeah. were looking for a fee. Yeah, um, but it was just the sort of the idea of having a, the bit of straw and were <laughs> kind of chewing on it, like, like Clint Eastwood, yeah. where we shouldn't. You know, <laughs> means that I'm for hire. Yeah, I'm yeah. a gun for exactly. hire. Exactly. And it went on till really the Second World War that brought an end to it mm-hmm. because it was deemed, you no, know, not quite in keeping with the whole. Dig for victory, Churchillian push for farming output. The fact that you could have the workers just 
moving every six months. So they had a sort of a standstill order that you were supposed to kind of bide on the on the right. farm that you were you were at. Um, or you could, I think you could be imprisoned. And I know there was a, a lot of guys that would speak about going down the how, which meant going to the prison in Perth, you know, from, from Strathmore, if, mm. if you sort of kicked up a bit of a rumpus about that. And once the Second World War finished, uh, it just never really got going again, the, the whole kind of fee and thing. But there mm. was a sort of, um, maybe sort of less formal approaches would be made by, uh, farmers to, you know, if they knew of someone's, the quality of their pluing or their, their rock bigging or whatever, um, then a farmer might approach, uh, a worker in the pub or so, or, you know, say that, that, that lad's wanting a word with you, that, that, that kind of thing. But the, the, the actual fee and market process stopped with the, with the Second World War, you know, and, and that kind of also, coincided really with the end of the horse farming era you know once once the horses stopped being your principal draft power then there was less need for folk uh, to to work there mm -hmm. and as the tractors came in there, there were tractor bothies um particularly you know down in angus um which would have sort of bigger arable farms and uh, up until the sort of 1960s, around about Glam's and Strathmore, there would be, uh, yeah, bothies where there were no longer horsemen in them; they were tractormen. Um, but come the come the 1970s, they were they were pretty thin on the ground. There might be the, the odd kind of, you know, solitary bothy dweller on on various farms mm -hmm. and stuff. But I, mean, I always kind of associated both <laughs> ballads more with kind of like. Well, Aberdeenshire and uh -huh. Angus, that kind of east yeah. coast of Scotland. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mind me further, I used to run, wait, radio broke during the 1959, just coming oh. up for like Christmas and New Year. Okay. And me old man wanted another wireless to, um, listen to the, the, uh, the, the program at Hogmanay. Uh -huh. And, uh, he went to Robbie Milne shop in Kirkwall and Robbie Milne being a sharp cookie. Said, ah, boy, you know, I think I'm getting a telly. Uh -huh. Oh, I didn't want a telly. Oh, well, no, you thought they were dangerous. There would be a fire hazard. Yep. Didn't want one of them. Ah, boy, he says, tuck the, tuck this telly. I'll tell you what. He says, you just tuck the telly home with you. Right. And watch it over the new year. And if you don't like it, tuck it back and we'll fix you up with a radio. Okay. And of course, for that moment on, the old man was a telly <laughs> And the one program that you know, used to watch a Cairn Gorn ski nights and he loved this bothy neck. Oh yeah. Yep. So he would watch Bothy Ballads yeah. on telly. Yeah. So that was Bothy Nichts was a program on Grampian television, mm -hmm. which has since been subsumed by STV. But at, at that time Scotland was divided into three areas for you know, what is now the ITV channel, channel channel three. And that was the kind of first uh, sort of commercial broadcast TV station in Britain. You know, you had the BBC and then ITV came on the go. So Grampian, um, maybe as the name suggested, was centred in Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. But the broadcast would also go to the Highlands, Highlands and all the islands, I think, uh, down to Angus, Dundee. I think maybe Fife, uh, sort of middle of Fife was where the crossover started into STV which was the sort of central Scotland commercial broadcaster. And then there was Border TV, which was um, the southern bit of Scotland and the northern bit of, of England. And uh, Bothy Nichts, uh, I can't remember the exact dates of the, the programme, but I think it finished in maybe sort of 1971, 1972. Mm. And the sort of format was you had a, like a kind of concert party type group. and. The, I think it was a, a competition between a, a couple of different concert parties in, in each episode. And it was, you know, who they thought was the most entertaining. So you would have like people singing, playing the muthi and the fiddle. And it, it was very much just based on that, that sort of local musician groups. Like you would hear, you know, you know we, were, we were speaking about uh, Billy Jolly early, earlier on today. And, um, you know, he would kind of embody that within within Orkney, just, just this sort of 
people performing in their local hall with their whichever musicians kind of were, were from the area. I also remember this guy Nigel Jelks who lived in Kirrymuir and Nigel was a great fiddle player and mandolin player, but he was he was also very English. Mm-hmm. And uh, whereas all of the other uh, the kind of the premise of the Botty Nicht show was that you know you were Geordie the cattleman or Will the the, the, the horseman or, uh-huh. or you know Geordie the or whatever. Um but they 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 clearly realised they could do nothing with Nigel to try and make him into a far worker. So he was just given the the sort of nickname Cousin Nigel up for England. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought like, they would have just stuck a hat on him and called him the Laird. <laughs> oh, here's the Laird. Come on. So Nigel was in a, <clears throat> a group, I think, called the, the Memis Middenhoppers. And mm. Memis is a, a wee sort of uh, village and area just at the the, the foot of the Angus Glens, uh, mm. Greg Clover. Would and, I be translating uh, that right it's the, to mean midding hoppers? I think it was hopper as in uh, to, to cover up something. Mm. Um, I'm not really sure why you would hop your midden. In I've never days. heard of that. We, uh, we, we certainly never but covered this it up. Was, this was just what they were, uh, they were called. I should um, probably explain that. A, a midden <laughs> was the, um, the dung heap. Hi. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and the Botty Nichts, yeah, was, was amazingly popular. Supposedly, I just heard quite recently that the, the reason it stopped was because um, the, the sort of, I don't know if it's equity or wh- wh- whichever kind of union represented professional performers, mm. they objected a wee bit to, you know, the clearly amateur performers getting all this sort of ear I don't, I don't know enough about that. Oh. But I don't know how true that was. But I've heard that from a couple of sources that that, that was the thing that sort of maybe put a, a death knell on it, that the fact that these folk didn't think that, you know, that the amateur... Amateurs should be getting this just this snobbishness. Show. Well, possibly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I was in a, a, you know, long after the Bothy nights had ended, I, right. I was in a, a, a very similar Bothy concert party called the Freak Corn Kisters. And mm. Freak, uh, well, Freak, it's short for Freakum, which is a village in the in the middle of Anger. Mm. And uh, we would sort of, so there was who of us, so there was me. There was Jordy Anderson, who's a fiddle player, and also a, find, a, a founder member of the Foundry Bar Band. Uh, great favourites here in Orkney. There was Willie McCarty, who was also in the Foundry. There was a guy called Davy Adams, who he played the sort of various percussive things. He played the spoons and the, and the washboard, and he was a real expert in body life. He wrote a book called Body Nichts and Days, mm. which is still the sort of uh, set text for, it was, I think, published in 1991, I think. And he had just interviewed, oh, about 70 or 80 of these old body lads who were still very much in the go at that time, just about their lives mm. from, I guess, the sort of 1920s um, through to the end of the the, the Bothy period and I so there was four of us plus a lady called Mary Pendrich and she was a singer and we would just go around just various bowling clubs in Angus uh, doing, it, doing our stuff and uh, yeah it was a real a real sort of demand people people really sort of uh, liked it you know it was, a, it was a good thing So how did you get into it? I well I was just um, very much brought up in the, the Bothy heartland of Angus so it, just outside Forfa. And um, mum would take us to local events. So there's an organisation called the Traditional Music and Song Association of Scotland, which uh, are very active in Angus at that time and still are. And they would put on a Cayley every month, just throughout Angus, just, just various uh, towns and villages. And we'd go along to that and they have a yearly festival in Kerrymuir every September, and once you kind of started going to that, the sort of the whole world of these similar festivals opened up, and it was quite a sort of circuit back then that musicians and singers would just spend this the summer going to these these different festivals, and still do. I mean, mm-hmm. 
myself, I would, uh, I always kind of think uh, in my head, I realise January's the start of the year, but for me, the sort of, the festival year kind of starts off in May, coming up here to the Orkney Folk Festival, mm. um, the end of May, and then Port Soy the week after, then Keith the week after that, and it sort of goes goes on and on through till through till September, mm. and uh, it's great. Everyone's everyone seems to have motorhomes now, you know. That's mm. a, that's the stage of their life. So so they're able to just uh, just spend weeks on end just in the in their motorhomes. Mm. Um, but I so I very much got into that sort of circuit as as a wee boy, and because you know you're you're quite that's quite an unusual thing. So I guess you would get asked to do a lot more things than you maybe would if you were just introduced to it as a, as an adult, and yeah. So just from hearing hearing these singers in person, you know, very, very fortunate that mm. there were so many of the great tradition bearers still on go, very much mm. uh, turning up to these things. So uh, I mean, although sort of, I guess you'd say my first love would be that bothy song tradition. You would also have a lot of the. Traveller singers would attend these things as well, and mm -hmm. uh, there would be um, a competition. That's daytime on the Saturday. These festivals would tend to be competition focused, so there'd be like storytelling competitions, uh, bothy ballad, muthy poetry, and stuff. And you would still have, you know, Stanley Robertson would come and he would enter usually storytelling, and the the bothy and the the men singing. Mm -hmm. um, and the Stuarts would sometimes come from from Blair and stuff. So, so you very much had just this great melting pot of all these traditions that weren't necessarily the most kind of commercialised traditions, mm. but, but you, you know they'd be focused usually in a in a small town. That the, the festival would be very much part of the fabric of that town. They would use all the wee halls and mm. and venues and stuff. And really, if you just kind of showed up each year. Then you couldn't really avoid sort of soaking all that that stuff in. Mm. Yeah. Stanley was quite a character. <laughs> Read me fortune once uh -huh. at Bob Pig's house. Okay, during a, a Tales from Martin's festival in right. November, and uh, <clears throat> we'd had a we'd ha we'd had a few refreshments, shall we say, with the exception of Stanley, who didn't drink. Oh, of course. Well, he did gallons and gallons <laughs> of diet coke. But um, <clears throat> he didn't touch anything alcoholic. But he said, right, Loon, he says, hold out your hands with your fingertips pointing up. So I did, and he touched my fingertips, and he goes, you're going to get a piano? And I said, eh? You're going to get a piano? I says, but I don't play piano, Sonny. Oh, this is the you're getting a piano. And a birdcage. And I went, hey? He goes, oh, you're getting a birdcage, or something like a birdcage. And I said, so, look, it is right, Stanley. I'm going to get a piano playing budgie, am I? <laughs> and he goes, well, that's what I see anyway. <laughs> and uh, if you were to kind of, you know, I suppose, really kind of look into that sort of thing, did get a piano. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't know Rhonda Eklund, as, as you would have been, well, you were probably Rhonda Brene at that time, but um, I didn't know you at that time. but. We ended up buying a piano for Jennifer Wrigley. Okay. <laughs> so there is a piano in the house. And the thing that looks like a birdcage is probably that lantern from a, an old Victorian um, gas lantern from a, a boy from okay. floating around in the sea. Or okay. buoy, as you Americans would say. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know why, but... Uh, so anyway, I digress. Yeah. No, I was kind of, I, <clears throat> I, I lost Stanley as well. I know. Mm. I, what, one of my favourite... Um, Stories says there's this great singer from Aberdeen City itself called Danny Cooper. Mm. And Danny's like a great supporter of traditional music events, has been since he was in his teens, I suppose. And Danny eh, runs a fish processing business in, mm. in Aberdeen. And of course, Stanley was a fish gutter, mm -hmm. you know, for most of his adult life. And he'd always said to Stanley that kind of, if ever. You know, if ever you're finding work slack and wherever you normally work, there's, there'll always be a job for you here, Stanley. Mm. And, and one time Stanley had taken him up on the sofa and I think it was mostly mostly women that were the regulars in, in Danny's place. And Stanley had been 
you know, just sort of chatting away. And I think he hadn't been, you know, he hadn't been sort of too, you no, know, he hadn't been arm Stanley Roberts, the great storyteller, you know, but the, the wife he's kind of got it out of him that he was, he told stories and stuff. And uh, the sort of coaxed, oh, come on and tell us a story. So he, he told them a ghost story, you know, and there was no one like Stanley, no one mm-hmm. had touched Stanley when it came to the, to the ghost stories. And <laughs> the, the, the workers were all that petrified by him that they all had to get taxis home that night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, the Marco good storyteller! <laughs> and they kind of came back next morning and, and kind of ref- refused to return uh, uh, unless uh, uh, if that boy was still there. You know, he was just. And uh, Daddy would say that you know the the women they were never normally that militant, but he felt that he had to sort of uh, you know give in to their their request. You know, but uh, yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, boy. Uh, so. No, we were doing a, a wee gig the other night, and uh, you mentioned about a story that was, that was at the second one that you'd ever sung or something like that. So what was the first song that you ever sang? All right. I, well, it, so this would have been in Primary 4, and Mrs. Esplin, who was uh, a great Primary 4 and 5 teacher, and uh, sometimes at the end of the day, if there was like, you know, the, the class had sort of finished, but there was maybe five, ten minutes before before uh, the bell rung. She would just say, oh, I can, Scott, you can maybe give us a give us a song. So it was this primary four and five of Chapel Park Primary School became this real hotbed of body ballads. <laughs> 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 Which was just, uh, just very unusual. And, uh, yeah, so the Bellina was the second one. The first one was actually called the... Uh, <coughs> The Spark Among the Heather, which was a song that Jim Reed wrote about the Highland Clearance. Uh, Jim Reed was mm. of the, the Foundry Bar Band. And mm. then the third one, I think, was called Guys of Tuch, which is very much your sort of standard bothy ballad mm. in that um, it starts off with the guys signing up to work in a particular farm mm. and just all the kind of things that mm. happened after that. Um, Would you fancy giving us a wee rendition of something that was just like a, a traditional bothy ballad aye. for the folk out there that are sitting yeah. on the other side of the world thinking, well, <laughs> I, get, I get it now, I under, kind of understand what you mean by it, but I still have no idea what a bothy ballad <laughs> sounds like. Aye, well, I'll give you, as you can, uh, I'm a wee bit under the limbs up th- today, but mm-hmm. uh, we'll, gi- we'll give it a go. Uh, it's the only voice I've got, you know. So I could sing the, I'll sing the guys at two one, and um, I, I'll, I'll maybe just sing a bit of it, and then we can then chat a bit after if that, if that makes sense. Whatever you wish. Just got a chorus if you fancy joining in. I think <laughs> for the sake of our listeners, I won't. Okay. I don't want letters <laughs> or death threats. <clears throat> Now I ain't coming but a third and four to get the fee. Twas there I met we Jamie Brun and there we did agree. Dum a hi dum do, a hi dum day. Hi dum a diddle dum a hi dum day. So I agreed with Jamie Brune in the year of 91, digging him and Ka his second pair and be his or a man. Dum a hi dum do, a hi dum de, hi dum a diddle dum, a hi dum de. When I get him to guise a tooth, it was an evening clear. Fair about some or a house the gaffer did appear dum a hi dum do a hi dum day hi dum a diddle dum a hi dum day says I'm the mister o oh, the place and that's the mistress there and if you want some breed or cheese, you'll surely get your share dum a hi dum do a hi dum de, hi dum a diddle dum, a hi dum de. 
Then I get to the stable, my pairy for to view, and fax they were a dandy pair, a chestnut and a blue, dum a hi dum do, a hi dum de, hi dum a diddle dum, a hi dum de. Then early next morning I get to the plough, but long, long a losing time my pairy guard me ru, dum a hi dum do, a hi dum de, hi dum a diddle dum, a hi dum de. The plough she was no working wheel, she couldn't throw the far. The gaffer says it's a better in it, the smiddy take a fort. Dum a hi dum do, a hi dum de, hi dum a diddle dum, a hi dum de. When I get him the new blue, she pleased me, Uncle Wheel. Though I thought she would be better, gin she had a cotton wheel. Dum a hi dum do, a hi dum de, hi dum a diddle dum, a hi dum de. My song is nearly ended. And I'll no sing any more. And if you be offended, she can walk outside the door. Dum a hi dum do, a hi dum de, hi dum a diddle dum, a hi dum de. Hey, what up? Fabulous. Excellent. Hey, brother. Yeah. Ah, my, my. So, aye, so that was Guys I Took It And it's mm-hmm. a classic One of the only Bothy Balance Where we have a specific year It talks about the year of 91 mm-hmm. Which would have been 1891 Yeah And uh, just this guy Going to the Fiend Market In Afford Which is on Donside Maybe I don't know About 30 miles west of Aberdeen Maybe And uh, in, Engages with this particular farmer and he goes back, and unlike you know, so, so much of what maybe people think of Scottish folk song being ballads about kings and knights and fairies and all that kind of stuff, it's it's a lot more prosaic than that. Mm-hmm. It's very much just the social history mm-hmm. of the the day to day life. Um, and so he he goes to the farm. He has some bread and cheese. And then he goes to see his horses and he thinks, oh, these are these horses are all right, you know? And the next day he goes to do a bit of pluing, but the pluing's, you know, the plue's not working very well. So he goes to the smiddy, which is the, the blacksmiths, and he gets a, another plue. And that plue works a wee bit better. And and then that's it. That's that's kind of the end of the song. There is a lot more verses to it, uh, which I wouldn't normally sing, but the most of the other verses just would would speak about each of the the particular people that work on the farm. So they'd have a usually a kind of like sort of piss taken type verse just about each of the characters. And I always kind of think it's you know if if we were asked to write a song, not that I'm suggesting we should do this, but about our work colleagues or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, and you'd have a verse about each of them. And it, mm-hmm. uh, if you were to if someone was to look at it. In a hundred years' time or a hundred and thirty years' time, and, and be all sort of serious about, oh yes, this guy he did that in the museum or whatever. Um, and I just think at the time, a lot of it was just written in fun, you know. So, mm-hmm. so it, it shouldn't really be taken as mm. as, as gospel. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love my uh, my colleagues. <laughs> I do, <laughs> but I mean, again, that there are sort of traits that you could kind of, you know. Take the mickey of, yeah. you know, like mild leg pulling, yeah. you would say, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, nothing malicious or, or nasty. But then, like you say, given that length of time, then you start thinking that, oh, you really didn't like them, you yeah. know, but it's just yeah. having a laugh. Because you know you're going to get a laugh in the bothy at night when you're singing that and everybody, you know, guy yeah. sitting there and all the rest of them are around yeah. and uh, and they're all kind of going, oh, I hope he does me kind of thing, you know, because yeah, exactly. you don't want to be the one left out that you're exactly. boring, you know. I got yeah. asked to do a thing. What is it? Just, it must have been sort of autumn 2022. And there's this 
programme on Radio Scotland called Out of Doors. I don't know if you heard of that. Mm-hmm. And one of the main guys, Ewan, was retiring um, from it and they got in touch with me and said, what oh, do you think? You know, we're trying to think of a great present to, to give him and we're wondering if you'd be up for writing a bothy ballad about Out, huh? out of Doors. And I said, oh, I don't really write songs really uh, they were like oh you'll be fine just just do it <laughs> and I said well you do realise that you know a classic body ballad would have quite a lot of piss taken you know it, it would be like kind of quite sarky and, and, and they were like yes yeah that's exactly that's exactly <laughs> what we want you know so it just became that sort of just about his time on the show and like we verses about mm-hmm. all of the the different different folk you know and mm-hmm. so very much using that that bothy ballad format but clearly not about mm-hmm. a particular farm you know about this this kind of radio show and stuff. do you fancy do you know yeah. about that or do you think we'd end up being sued I, uh, I can't really mind how it goes ah. I could send you it though if you want to uh, I do have I will if you, if you send um, us a recording we can yeah. always we yeah. can stitch it into yeah. this yeah um, that's the thing with any I like you tend to not remember things that you've written yourself very well, you know. Mm. Uh, uh, not that I write a huge amount, mm. like, but um, uh, aye, I'll I'll see if I can track it down. That would be good. We can just yeah. stick it in right yeah. here. Yeah. Need a little pause. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you think of that? <laughs> oh, that was that was that was cracking, man. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, bye. So that kind of early, you know, like you said, you're singing at, at primary school when you're about, what, seven or eight or something like that? I, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, how did that go to ending up being the performer that you are today and the well-known and well-respected performer that you are today? Just, you know. Just kind of just through turning up, the, you know. Just um, going along to you, sessions. You just go and, along to these things and competitions. Aye, yeah, do. I mean, very much kind of grown up, the the thing that you did at these festivals, which you would enter the, the singing competitions. Mm-hmm. And there would be kind of two strands of it. There was, there was sort of, um, usually run sort of side by side. So the, the men singing and the, Bothy ballad competitions would, be, would tend to be run sort of all in a one And um, there was a couple of different ways of doing it, but generally you would sing one Bothy ballad and one traditional song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, that's always a bit difficult to try and define exactly what a traditional song is. Um, but one of the working definitions at, at that time was that it had to be older than 50 years. Um, so a song like uh, Princey and Jean the, mm-hmm. that we've been talking about recently, it, it, you know, people would now maybe consider that to be traditional just by virtue of it having been uh, written in the late 1950s. Mm. Um, but the, if you ever look at these rules on any of the festival's websites, however, it's always a wee bit kind of wooly, um, mm. kind of perhaps deliberately left like that but mm-hmm. because as soon as you try and say what a traditional song is then you mm-hmm. anyone can come up with loads of examples that don't mm-hmm. don't fit into this um, but i mean bothy ballads is about as traditional a scottish song as you can get I, you can I yeah mean, it's, yeah yeah so I suppose they would always sort of say, heather and mist and yeah i think long yeah. lost lands i think that the sort of rationale behind those kind of rules was just to avoid the slightly sort of cheesier Heather and Mist type songs mm-hmm. you know, were, were kind of prevalent at that time mm-hmm. and uh, to try and provide a platform for you know the more authentic folk song if you if you want to go mm-hmm. on that um, so that's that's the kind of mm-hmm. the sort of world that I, I grew up in mm-hmm. and um, there was kind of well three main festivals I go to as a as a child mm-hmm. um, there was Keith Festival which is in June and there was Ochter Mochte um, which is in August or was in August Mukti Mukti sadly is no more mm-hmm. and then the Kerry Festival in, in September and I still you know still go to to Keith and to Guy I help run the Kerry Festival nowadays and um, yeah they're just uh, 
I think it's a great way of just becoming involved in the, in that world. Mm. You just meet so many folk, so many great pals for, from kind of just been. It's almost I kind of think that if you had to think of a way to you know make as many pals as possible in the shortest amount of time, mm. almost to kind of go into a festival every maybe two, three times a year where you see the same folk and you hang out with them, but then you don't see them till till next year. But you still have, you know, 30 years of history with these people. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's a real sort of... But you just to pick up where you, right where you left off, exactly. you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like you haven't seen them for a year, but it could have just been a week. Aye. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's a lot more than that, you know, but mm-hmm. you know yourself, it's, it's, it would be the same with the storytelling, you know. Aye. Because you've maybe had a, quite an intense experience mm. a, a particular weekend in, in some place mm-hmm. where you're all kind of hanging out and eating together and mm-hmm. uh, sort of entertaining each other and then could be like a decade th- before you see those mm-hmm. people again but you're just straight back mm-hmm. into, you know? and so when you were growing up and like I said you were a young guy and you were going to these competitions and all that who was your inspirations? Who who were the people that you that you listened to I, that that really kind of yeah, well, you know the, shaped the way that you you yeah. wanted to sing or the, or the way that the, the music you loved? Yeah, I guess the if you had to say the sort of the the main singers that always you loved, um, there a lot of them from pretty local to us. So Jim Reed from Lethem, mm-hmm. he was just over the hill, like maybe two miles as the crow flies. And Joe Aitken from Kerry Muir, again, he was maybe six or seven miles away. And there's a guy called Jordy Anderson from Freakham, who's yeah. a freak corn kister, as I was talking about. Yeah. Um, and Tom Reed from Aberdeenshire. Uh, I first heard Tom when I came up to the Keith Festival, and I remember thinking he was just, he was just brilliant. He was kind of the, he was the bothy ballad king, because yeah. they'd had this competition in, uh, 1977, I think. And uh, actually, Stanley was in it. So, so Stanley, mm. you wouldn't think of Stanley as being a bothy ballad singer. But I think mm-hmm. he came second. Mm. And Tam Reed, Tam Reed won. And mm. uh, this was the, his uh, title. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom died in uh, it's just over 20 years ago now. Mm. But this was his kind of title throughout his, throughout his life. And there was also a guy from Bucky called Ian Middleton. Um, and Ian was more of a songwriter and a, and a poet. Um, and yeah, I think if you had to maybe pick, you know, half a dozen or so, there'd be those lads. Plus, Jock Duncan was a, a really inspiring character. Um, and yeah, Jock was just an amazing, uh, fount of, of knowledge, but everything. He had an amazing memory for stuff. And Jock was from just outside Fivey in Aberdeenshire, but um, he'd lived in Pitlochry since maybe the 1960s. Um, and so he was away from that farm life. He worked for the hydro board, but uh, he just had the kind of bothy stuff running right through him, you mm. know. And so it'd be Jock. And also uh, Gordon Easton was another uh, good, good pal. And Gordon was from near Fraserborough in Buchan. And Gordon was almost a one-man bothy nicht. He, he sang and he did poetry and he did diddling and uh, he played like in the Muthi. He, he started off as, as a fiddle player, I guess, when he, when he was wee. And it, it was only when he was in his 60s that he came to the Keith Festival and entered one of the singing competitions. Uh, kind of only because his wife was not, wasn't around to hear him, basically. <laughs> and he won this and that was the kind of start mm. of his his life in, in that world you know and they were all very supportive there was a real there still is I would say a real camaraderie between all these uh, Bothic guys and regardless of you know it's quite disparate ages and there's a, there's a lot of women singing Bothy ballads now as well so, so you have like all these kind of like the, the demographics are sort of all over the place mm. but there, there's just a real, you know, uh, well, just while I've been here in Orkney, I've been trying to get a few folk together for a, a tribute to Jock Duncan um, that's going to be held in June. And you just have to mention it to them in the email, you know, and they're all like, yeah, 
yeah, no bother, we're there. Mm -hmm. That's that's fine, you know. Just you just write whatever you want about us in the biographies and stuff. Um, and that's just a real tremendous kind of ethos and, and way of life to be part of. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's a wee bit like that with storytelling yeah. as well. You can, I mean. You want to do wheel. You don't want to be showing up on stage yeah. in front of somebody else. You can. <laughs> but at the same time, there isn't a competition going on there. You know, you're like I travelled a lot with, with Lawrence Tullock for Shetland. You can, and me and Lawrence were like brothers. You know, and, yeah. and um, um, when he passed, I mean, there was uh, I was going to Slovenia, and they said we want to do a tribute concert right. to Lawrence in Ljubljana. Okay. Because we had worked out there doing some workshops and stuff like that, encouraging young storytellers out there. And we all got together and just celebrated his life. It was kind yeah. of, you know, it was it was very emotional. But that is the kind of thing that happens is you, you all sort of yeah. get together. And when one of the number passes, everybody feels it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We've just had that this last week with Billy Chawley. Exactly. Uh, Billy was a, a much loved singer and entertainer here in, in Orkney. Um, my brother John used to work with, for him as a fish fellow. Uh -huh. He had a, a fish shop. Right. And, um, Billy was just the, he can, there's a term that we always use up here, which is probably completely old fashioned and, and just out the window. And away. He was a Chester. Okay. Right. Didn't mean he wore a silly hat with bells yeah. on it. Yeah. He was just a right chest, and you, yeah. you were somebody that was funny that made you laugh. You come in the room, and it's like, thank God Billy's here because yeah. nowhere get a laugh. You yeah. can yeah. lighten the mood. Exactly. I mean, I like Billy was also a big part of the uh, this singing weekend that um, was organised on Tom Reed's farm in in Aberdeenshire, Tom and Ann, um, place called Killerley, and pretty much, I think Billy was at the second. Killerly and you know we'd try and come down every year some years he didn't make it because he was in hospital and stuff um, and he was such a highly regarded part of that fabric of, of folk you know and he would make a creepy once he started mm -hmm. once he retired and he started <clears throat> making the creepies mm -hmm. even if Billy didn't make it down the creepy would always make it down for the raffle <laughs> on the on the Sunday and mm. it was always uh, everyone would buy tickets to try and try mm. and win this. Oh, this creepy. I should explain for folks. Oh, I have no idea. That <laughs> a creepy has got nothing to do with Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a creepy is for life, not just Halloween. Yeah, it's a small wooden stool. Aye, and uh, we have a Billy Jolly creepy upstairs yeah. actually. So, um, which was always much loved, but knew it has become much more mm. kind of important as well because Aye. Billy made it. Yeah. You know, yeah, but uh, yeah, he was quite a quite the character. But, yeah. but I mean, you must have done a lot of festivals in your time as well, all I, over. And yeah, I mean, most most years, um, it'd be pretty much all in Scotland, apart from maybe a couple of trips somewhere more exotic. Um, so where are we going this year? Um, Dorset. Wow. In May. I've never uh, been to Dorset. Are you not? No. Well, if you fancy a trip, then. I've never been that far <laughs> south in, 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 in England. Okay. I mean, further south in the world. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I think in Cornwall in a few weeks. No. Uh, not been there either. Ireland. Mm. And, yeah, I think I think that's all the... What about St. Ireland places. that you're after? It's in Dublin. Ah. So, it's part of the St. Patrick's mm -hmm. Festival. There's a thing... It's actually uh, Len Graham's going to as oh yeah, a mm -hmm. Irish storyteller. Oh and it's, Jesus! Uh, I think it's the thing we are doing is a sort of farmy type songs of Ireland and Scotland. I think mm -hmm. it's the, the sort of gist, you know. I hosted Len Graham and John Campbell. <laughs> Tell me that. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should just say that. When you're organising a festival, like we do with the storytelling one here, things don't always go to plan. Yeah, that's, that's the same with the festivals I run as well. I do. No, like, for the folk festival, of course, comparing the Orkney Storytelling Festival to the folk festival is like, you know, 
a wee guy that's got a wee stall that sells whelks, comparing <laughs> that to like Microsoft, you know, <laughs> because they're both businesses. Um, they have numerous folk coming up, yeah. lots of lots of logistics to work out who gets where and such like. So I was asked if I would come and uh, and host, you know, compare MC for for Len and and John. I did not actually ken I was doing that until I got a phone call that day at work saying, "Oh, I see you. you're doing this hosting this thing tonight." And I went, "No, I knew that I was in it, right. but I." And they went, "Oh, it's in the paper. You're hosting it." So. Right. I don't know anything about these guys, so I had to go and try to find out, you can. And this was sort of early days of the internet, so you could probably get a pity bit, but no matter. But anyway, I turned up at the Strumness Hotel, and there was there was no Len and John. And I said, you know, what's, what's up? Oh, they've got on the wrong bus. They're, they're, on their, <laughs> they're on their way to Evie. And it was like, but we're starting five minutes, and they said, We've sent uh, Graham, <laughs> it was Graham Garson, I don't know if you should say this or not, but Graham, Graham <laughs> Garson, who's a, a lovely guy, dear friend, <coughs> we've sent Graham Garson in the car chasing after the bus right. to try to flag it down <laughs> and get them off and tap them back. And I said, well, what do I do in the meantime? And they said, I'll just, like, just tell some stories. And So I was there telling stories, and <clears throat> I managed to high chart three girls for the bar who had fiddles. Okay. I was doing a story where, you know, the guy, the fiddler that goes into the mound at Dingus ah, Howie and right. plays for the trows for a, for the New Year for their party and comes out 14 years and a day later. So I got them to come in to play a bit of fiddle as well because it wouldn't brack up the time a pity right. bit, you know. And um, then just when the audience was actually starting to turn nasty, because they had, <laughs> with some justification, they'd bought tickets to see yeah. Len Graham and right. Sean Campbell. <laughs> and all they got was this bloody <laughs> rabbit in the headlight Arcadian trying to kind of, you know, kidnapping women out of bars and, 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 and buying them beer right. out of my own pocket right. just to kind of keep it. <laughs> so then they turn up and it's like, oh, thank God. God for that, and they came, <laughs> and they were brilliant. I mean, Len singing was great. Yeah. Sean Campbell, the only time I ever seen him, what a storyteller! He, yeah. he had me in stitches. Yeah. The audience loved it. And then, it would, like after fifteen minutes, I was told when they came in, right, you've got to be doing stairs in fifteen minutes time because they're getting the bus to go to the final concert at the at the school. And I was almost lynched because it was like, okay. here's the guys for 15 <laughs> minutes and then they're just like getting into it. And then it's like, right, as it finished. I st okay. I'll barely got out of there alive. Right. Yeah. But, but that happens, at, yeah. you know. It's, uh, so I, I just really met John the, the one time he was a guest at Clearly mm -hmm. one year when I was a guest. And he was just lovely, you know, mm -hmm. he, he'd be in his, you know, a lot of that older generation of singers, they would always kind of wear their sort of Sunday best uh, when they were performing, unlike me and Tom. Mm -hmm. Well, unlike me, anyway. <laughs> I, <laughs> this, is, this is me Sunday best. It's not got holes in it. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, so he'd be in this sort of, you know, black suit. And he's a big, tall guy, you know, big, sort mm. of imposing figure uh, but just so funny and, mm. and just warm and, and, and genial you know? I remember the one line that always stuck in my mind was about this, this couple that had fallen out um, married couple because they were arguing as to who had to go and get water for the well oh, okay. and neither of them could be bothered so they decided to do you know the mooth music uh, they had to do that constantly Okay. And the the first to stop, right. hit the going at the wall, right. and then he says, "The priest turned up in his Rolls Royce," <laughs> <laughs> and he was furious because he was speaking to him, and they were both going, but him, but anyway, it was um, it was a real a pleasure to to meet yeah. the guy, but um, I mean, you must have ended up 
um, rubbing shoulders with a lot of people that you respected and as a I, as a young lad. Yeah, and that's that's the great thing mm-hmm. really, that that you sort of uh, get to get to hang out your musical heroes quite, mm-hmm. quite a lot. You know, I mean, uh, I guess of the of the folk that I mentioned earlier, Joe can still on the go, um, and Joe just lives in Kerry Muir, so I, I see Joe a lot. I saw him just on. And was it Tuesday? Was the last time? Mm-hmm. And uh, Jordy Anderson as well. Jordy's he must be be eighty nine this year, I think. Um, as as far as I know, he's still still on the go in Freecom. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's it's just brilliant. There's there's a real sort of I think within a lot of people just uh, I, an urge to see the various musical traditions that you're involved in continue to to thrive, you know, and uh, it maybe goes in sort of both directions age-wise, you know, that, that mm-hmm. sort of it's not purely just a older folk mm-hmm. handing on stuff to, to younger folk mm-hmm. um, and that whole kind of sort of multi-generational thing, I guess, mm-hmm. is, is just brilliant when, when you see a hall that's mm-hmm. just full of just Completely different mm. just a folk, both in terms of the performers and the, mm. the audience. It's a very healthy thing because if you've just got a room full of old folk, yeah. that's a tradition that is not going to be around for much longer. You know, you've got to get young folk involved and interested yeah. and enthused. Yeah. Mm. So you must have heard a few kind of stories about, you know, like, like I was saying about them. Len and John's story there, you must have had a few scrapes in your time as well, maybe a few. Uh, funny stories or something like that. Uh, are any of them broadcastable? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> shall we, shall we? Uh, inadmissible question, Your Honour. <laughs> <laughs> is this the Eighth Amendment? Was it the uh, Second Amendment? No, it's, it's the Eighth, isn't it? Plead, we were, the, plead the Eighth, we were, eighth Amendment. I was going to ask it. I was at a, a second weekend called Fife Sing, mm. which uh, happens in Fife, as you might think, in, in the middle of May. And uh, Jimmy Hutchison, the guy who was interviewing us, was saying, "So tell us about your your worst gigs. You know, like what, what were the ones that really were were bad? You know, and I honestly couldn't really think of anything because I think I've been quite fortunate in that most of the things that I've sung at it it's always been the audience has been there to hear that kind of stuff. You know? mm. it, and most of the kind of worst gig stories." tend to be where there's a sort of mismatch mm-hmm. between, you know, what the audience were expecting mm-hmm. and the person that, turned, maybe a bit like what you were saying there, were, you know, if if folk have come to hear mm-hmm. John and Len, yeah. um, then they're sort of, so, so I think maybe, Maybe all my worst gigs are still to happen. <laughs> but, but, uh, that's the, the worrying thing. And I think also because, you know, if, if you did these gigs when you're wee and, and young, you know, then folk are always going to sort of give you the benefit of the doubt of as well, I think. You know, so when's the first time that you pitched up here in Orkney? Oh, that would have been, uh, it must have been 2000, I think. For the folk festival, mm-hmm. and we've been to every folk festival since. Um, That's twenty-four years of folk festivals. Well, that's this, it. This May, that's it. yeah, <clears throat> it's a long mm-hmm. time. Um, and we just well, it was when I was at uni, and a whole bunch of us who were involved in the, I was quite involved in uni folk society at, at mm. that time, which is another uh, still thriving organisation. And mm. we kind of, it was coming to the end of the, the, the uni year and we thought it'd be really great for us just to go to a, a festival someplace. You know? And uh, there was a, a few places suggested, but uh, Tom Reed, the Bothy Ballad King, was on the bill at the Orkney Folk Festival and I just thought, this is where we should, we should go to hear, mm-hmm. go, go to hear Tom. So we hired a minibus and I think there's a bit, Ten of us in total the first year, and it was a real adventure, you know, <laughs> especially for a, a lot of the the real urban folk that mm-hmm. were, and it was in an era where I remember and there was only two folk that had mobile phones mm-hmm. at, at that time in the minibus, 
And they both, like, as soon as she got past Inverness, they just kind of switched off their phones because they kept that there was no use having one because they wouldn't work mm. up the uh, uh, north. And now we can always spot the rural type as soon as it's <laughs> yeah. It's just like fresh blood. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it just came up and everyone was so welcoming. The, the, the place that Tam was singing at was the, the song club in the community centre. Mm-hmm. And it was run by Graham Morris. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And Graham was really good. Crack and he was in actually a pop band in I, the sixties called poets, the, poets. the Poets. He was yeah. the drummer, and that. Yeah. they had their own TV show. He said, and, and had the Beatles on as guests. Yeah. When... <laughs> that's a yeah. that's a claim to fame. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, he he just kind of done that, and would get he was he was big pals with with that. I remember um, the first thing Tom said when he when he got up on the stage, he he just went. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard for some whiskey to quench her great thirst. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare. Graham Morris had gotten there first. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Almost true. It was, um, it was gin and tonic. You see. <laughs> I remember it well. And silk cut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And... Yeah, then we ju- we just got asked to, as a sort of group to to come back the next year and mm. and play as as guests. So know, that'll be your twenty fifth. It'll yeah. be twenty four years, but it'll be your twenty fifth festival. Aye. Yeah, this if year. you're going to count the COVID ones, because oh you know, yeah, of course, man. Unless you're hired, that's going to yeah. just up all these anniversary type things. We for, just pretended it didn't happen. I mean, I think you know. Orny did did so much to because obviously they had lots of stuff online. Yeah. But it's like Kerry, for instance, we did the deal. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I'm not really a very online kind of guy. Yeah. Well, neither am I, but yeah. we just kind of realised that we, you know, with the storytelling festival, that we had to do something. And yeah. it was just yeah. a kind of a placeholder, really. But, exactly. Uh, we were the first festival to start up again because it was a lull between COVIDs. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and <laughs> it was very heartening to know that I never had anybody in the audience that got it because we were being so yeah. cautious so careful with mask wearing and sanitation yeah. social distancing and uh, and it seemed to work yeah. so difficult we're a much bigger festival though like the folk festival i Aye. mean it's Aye. you're you're talking about much bigger numbers of yeah. people so yeah. just uh we had the the one in Calerly, um i keep going on a bit um we were able to have our First one, it must have been in 2021, July 2021. So we only missed a year, of, but mm-hmm. we, we had it, we called it the Super Saturday. So mm-hmm. instead of it being full weekend, it was just on the Saturday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we took quite a lot of precautions and uh, it was just after the, was it the road maps they talked about? You know, it was like stage mm-hmm. one or this. In Scotland it was, yeah. yeah. Scotland, eh? And... <clears throat> We had this, like a a head thermometer, <laughs> like on a stand, and so my job as people arrived in the marquee was basically to measure the temperatures of the of their heads, <laughs> 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 and and fortunately we, we never had anyone go all that high. I'm not quite sure what we'd have done if they had gone that high, but it was amazing. You you kind of you kind of think. That everyone's heads are sort of the same temperature, you know. But there was quite a. I dis- can't say I never actually <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> but... And you also could never. T- you you would sometimes think, oh, here's you know some real ruddy cheeked person coming mm. in there and might have a really hot head, but the, but no, you know, mm. it would be always the ones you you didn't expect would be have like a roasted heat. Mm. Um, and so we did that for a couple of years. Folk could and. Uh, Give them their due. I expected to get a lot of folk being quite complaining about this, you know, mm-hmm. why you have to do this. But everyone was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. People sort of guided their heads towards this thing. <laughs> and like, right, I this. Hate. <laughs> <laughs> to quote a famous Mike Myers film. <laughs> so we didn't have to have that uh, last year. Um, <laughs> but uh, I hopefully, hopefully that'll be the. The head thermometer in the mm. box for the 
foreseeable future. All right, I'm going to ask you a predictable question, but also an impossible one. Um, do you have a favourite song? Eh. I can't. It's a ridiculous question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like if you have sort of like a dozen kids in this right? What, what's your favourite yeah. child, you know? Pro <clears throat> probably the the one that I do like to sing the, mo the most is uh, one called uh, Generations Have Changed. Ah, it's a this beautiful song. Kind of, um, do you think we can uh, risk it or no? Because we don't, it's copyright issue. I don't think anybody can believe it on this time. Well, this is true. But I think maybe if you give a bit of background to it as well, I, we're not trying to rip off anybody's no. work here and all, but it is one of my favourites yeah. that you sing as well. It, it's just such yeah, an so, uh, um, I, I, emotional. I, I think it just, it, it seems to just touch folk mm -hmm. beyond, even folk that aren't really fans of, mm -hmm. so I maybe start of singing it a bit too often, because you know, folk are always... Hey, no, man, I mean it's good. it's like the Rolling Stones went on stage. Yeah. Go, we're not doing satisfaction <laughs> this time. You know? <laughs> There'll be a riot. You know? <laughs> so it was written by a guy called Matt Armour, mm -hmm. who was from Anstruther, but spent uh, most of his adult life living down in England. He was living, I think, in Milton Keynes, uh, latterly, mm -hmm. um, and he wrote. Lots, lots of songs, particularly ab about that kind of part of the world where he, where he grew up, the, the sort of East Nuke of Fife. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was really the one that just kind of caught on. Um, Scylla and Artie uh, Trezise, who uh, pre, they, they became the singing kettle mm -hmm. in the in the nineteen eighties, my son yeah. was absolutely addicted to that. <laughs> was sitting in front of the singing yeah. kettle video in those yeah. days, <laughs> yeah. Um, but prior to the singing kettle, the two of them would uh, you know play a lot of folk clubs as as a duo, and uh, they made an album with with this song on it, and it it really sort of caught on, you know. Yeah. So we were. Well, we'll have a go. Let's go for it. it. And Aye. Again, I'll give you the proviso that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll not be the best, but it's the only voice I've got. Ah, yeah. <laughs> You're a trooper, Scott. Yeah. You're a trooper. My feather was a bailey, free a wee place at Cape Lay. He worked. On the grand of the days of his life. By the time he made second, he I said he reckoned he'd plowed the run half of the East New Go Five. He feed on at Randerston, Crawhill and Clippington, Campbell and Carnby, and Bigger in his hill. At King's Barns he was married, and at Boar Hills he was buried. And man, had he lived, he'd been plowing on still. But those days were his days, and those ways were his ways. They follow the plough while his back was still strong. But those days are past. And the time come at last For the weakness of age To make way for the young I was nae for plowing To the sea I was going To follow the fish And the fisherman's ways Rain, hail and sunshine I watched the long run line Nae man mair contented, he's hail working day. I long lined the flooding grand, Dutch and the dogger bank, Pound the great fish from the deep devil's hole. A side trawled off Shetland, and Pharaohs in Iceland, And whether much war than a body could thaw. But those days were my days, and those ways were my ways. They follow the fish, 
while my back was still strong. But those days are past, and the time come at last, for the weakness of age to make way for the young. Now my sons, they have grown, and away they have gone. They search for black oil in the dark northern sea. Like oil men they walk, and like Yankees they talk. And there's no much in common between my sons and me. They've roughnecked on Josephine, Fortes and Ninian, Dunlin and Claymore, and Fisher and Dock. They've made fortunes for sure, for on one run ashore. They spend mere than I earn in a hail season's war. But these days are their days, and these ways are their ways. To ride the rougher eggs while their backs are still strong. But these days will pass, and the time come at last. For the weakness of age to make way for the young. Now my grandsons are grown to the school they are going. The long days of summer they spend here with me. We walk through the warm days, talk of the old ways, the cornfields, the codfish. The land and the sea. We walk through the fields that my feather once told. Talk to the old men that once sailed with me. Man, it's been off a good. I've told them all I could. Oh, their past and their present, what their future might be. For these will be their days, what will be their ways, what will they make of their land, sea, and skies? Man, I've seen half a change, but it still seems guy strange. They look at my world through a young lady's eyes. Uh, <coughs> what? Uh, just Thank you. What a song, <laughs> though, man. I mean, that's great. Yeah, that's aye, just... that's a, a beautiful piece of storytelling as well as writing, you know, music. It, it's, uh, I, I do like a, I do like a song with a story in it. Yeah. So um, that's just lovely. Yeah. So what's the future going to hold? Do you think? I mean, it's it looks I think pretty rosy still. I think just more of the same. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I helped run uh, a, a few musical events over the over the year now, so um, quite involved in the the Killerly Singing Weekend mm -hmm. and the Kirimir Festival, mm -hmm. and also help with a. Uh, a singing night in Edinburgh, which is called the World's Room, which is like a monthly thing. It's kind of like the Gid Crack Club, but for mm -hmm. for singing basically. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll have a a guest singer who'll do a dozen songs, and the rest is a a session. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's just about keeping these things thriving. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think there's there is uh, you know, there's folk up there for folk who are up for coming along, both to perform and to and to listen you know it's sometimes mm. just about getting in touch with those folk and and making sure that they can what's happening and, and, mm. and stuff you know? yeah and it's been about 10 years now since you started coming to the orney story to that'd be right as well. yes I, I am the i am the token singer <laughs> at the, the no you are <laughs> the the singer and uh i uh, i i did a get Worked too sorely at the Orkney Storytale Festival, has to be said. So it's always just a, a good relaxation come over, come October, you know. It's amazing as well to have you here. And it's no October or May. I, because you usually yeah. see you at the Folk Festival yeah. and then up for the 
yeah. storytelling festival at the end of October. That's sweet. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, what did you mark that the first time you were up? Because it was... Uh, Aye, yeah, it was a sort of baptism of fire, you it, know? Yeah, uh, it was the first... Got, First um, festival in this house in Strumlis. Okay, yeah. It just so yeah. I I mind. Um, I I think I got here on the Saturday afternoon mm. of the festival. So obviously, kind of three days into the, mm. the festival by that time, and I'd been judging a bothy ballad competition in Turf the night before, <laughs> and mm. the place we were, we were staying in. Mm. The Royal British Legion in Turf, which is like mm. one of these fancy British legions that has effectively hotel rooms. You know? mm. And uh, I just remember getting up. <laughs> and it, because we had to get up to get the ferry, mm. I had to get up at about, it's about quarter, to, quarter to six, or so pretty mm. early. Anyway. And uh, I was getting out, and the <laughs> they had this big sign on, on this this maybe a door through the kitchen uh, and it said you know do you not do not open this door you know uh, and it was like it had a glass you know there's a door that had glass in it and and um but it was just like to sink and stuff and I, I don't know what possessed me but i thought oh, i have to <laughs> <laughs> I have to find it i have to just see what's in here and all these just a lot of them started going on <laughs> 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 like, but because it was kind of fine so fine for the the ferry I I was like well I kind of really stood like there was, didn't seem to be any anybody rushing down the, the stairs so, so my last kind of uh, my adieu to the Tour of British Legion was just so that was the start of my, my day up to up to Lundy mm. and um, got here and uh, I think was was met off the boat and I can't remember what we'd have done uh, that night. Oh, I suspect I can guess what we did that night. <laughs> Same as every other night. Though. Yep. <laughs> it's usually long nights and uh, uh, yeah, and um, it must have been in lots the, of whiskey. It's maybe in the the still room in the Strumness Hotel. Actually, the mm. the sort of farewell, the farewell thing. They'd been Betty's reading them as as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, some of these venues, we just we can't play any, we can't do any more because, like, yeah. still room and all that. Um, it's it's just too small. Yeah. Um, I've seen us just being absolutely packed out in that place and having a fire on right. in there, and it was unbearably hot because yeah. you're, like, stuck next to a fire. You can't move, and, of course, there's so many folk in the room that it's, yeah. like, boiling, you know. And uh, we, we had to kind of cut doing on that a wee bit with the um, open mic sessions because we'd have about 17 folk all wanting to tell a story, which is supposed to be no more than 10 minutes, but sometimes folk can go a bit over um, by half an hour or so. Right. So it's uh, it kind of became a victim of its own success, really, with uh -huh. that one. But ah, well, anyway... Yeah. Which is mucking up as we go along. Well, I think it seems to be great. It's yeah. great seeing so many folk coming out. I mean, the, well, I guess it was in the community centre this year past, but it's probably the Strumness Town Hall is the, mm. the standard venue yeah. for it now. And, you know, to have 100 people turning up on a Sunday night mm -hmm. to hear storytelling, mm -hmm. plus one song. <laughs> <laughs> they, turn, they turn up for the song well, they, they, they sit through Endure all the storytelling but Just it, to get a song it, It's great, you know It's, it's really mm. thriving it? Well, yeah, I mean The, the Strum is uh, Toon Hall is, is a favourite venue But the one that started to become A real uh, wonderful one for us As well is mm. just the cathedral Yeah Using St Magnus Cathedral yeah. And uh Last year, um, we had Catherine Souter, artist, was up drawing along to live storytelling. And she said it was a highlight of our life. Right. I thought, don't tell your son that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's lovely to hear comments like that. Yeah. So, you know, that it's actually something that really means something to folk, you know, that it makes it all kind of worthwhile. And if you have a venue like that, kind of like Betty Street, you know, it's, I think, festivals 
focusing on their strengths is the way to go, you know, and mm -hmm. you have places that are just really great and everyone loves, you know, then mm -hmm. it's good, yeah. good to use them. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, we always try to find different venues. And then there was a point that I thought, why are we doing this? We can have different venues that we go around different parts of the... Aye, different islands. Or the, yeah. the main, different islands, different parts of the mainland. But, you know, just as long as you... Uh, as long as it's a venue that's good, there's no reason to not yeah. keep using it the same, you know, every year or... And then mix it in some of the smaller ones, you yeah. know. But, I mean, the... The one part of the Storytelling Festival, which is very popular, is, is Fran Flett Hollenreich's tour around the graveyard uh -huh. and talking about people who are buried there and paying tribute to them, absent friends, it's called. Yeah. And we did one um, a few years ago in Harry, uh -huh. and one of the graves that we stood by was Jordi Corrigal, who was known as the Bard of Ballarat yeah. because he had this... Uh, the the firm that he he worked on was named after uh, Ballarat is I think uh, um, a gold in Australia claim in Australia yeah. for the gold rush in Australia. Yeah. So uh, obviously yeah. somebody had been out there trying their luck. Aye. And um, but then there is a, a strange connection there between Orkney and Bossy Balance. Uh -huh. Is there no? <laughs> Over <Aye>. to you. <laughs> Aye, so I, I think the connection you're alluding <clears> to, <throat> Tom, mm -hmm. is, is um, Jordi Corrigal in the, the People's Journal. Uh, People's Journal was a Dundee-based publication uh, which often invited people to, to send in things that they'd, they'd written, really, be it poems or articles or songs. And they had uh, at least one competition for a newly composed Bothy ballad. And I think when uh, Jordi got wind of this, he pretty much by return of post, he had written this song called Prince and Jean. And uh, I, don't th I don't think it won the competition. It, it, it came, came third. Mm -hmm, third yeah. But it, it definitely, of, of all of them, it, it sort of has had the the last most lasting effect over the over the years, and it was again one of the first songs that I would uh, would have started singing in in primary primary five. This would have been, um, and it, yeah, it became Tom Reed who have spoken about it. It was sort of his signature song, mm. I'd say, so much so that a lot of people just assumed it was a an Aberdeenshire song, you know, because there's mm -hmm. nothing a, about it that you would think, oh, that's an Orkney song. You mm -hmm. know, it, it, it's all it could have happened in any sort of uh, bothy part of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, aye, well, well, do you fancy having a go at singing it? Aye, I was, I was, <laughs> I was planning to. Okay, I was, <coughs> I was just getting the old, uh, the old larynx <laughs> ready okay. and. Um, but no, I mean, you were saying uh, as well that that, that song actually took a, a quite a, a major award oh, I, in yeah. Bothy Ballad in the Bothy Ballad world. Yeah. So every the I think uh, I think at the start of this podcast, I can't remember. Eh, we were talking about the Elgin Bothy mm. Championships, and um, there's usually six or seven sort of uh, singers invited. To participate in that, mm -hmm. who have won other competitions during the previous year, and uh, the guy who won it was a guy called Paddy Buchanan, who's a relatively recent convert to the to the Bothy world, and uh, Paddy sung Prince and Jean, having heard it for the first time at Calerly, um as part of it, because last year it was twenty years since Tom died. Mm -hmm. A lot of the folk who go there now never met Tom. And sort of didn't know much about him, so we thought we should have something just to kind of, like, you know, so so that we don't always feel we we have the knowledge. We're trying to impart that. And Joey can, who was kind of Tom's best pal at, at so many of these festivals, Joe, uh, sung Prince and Jean, and uh, Paddy thought this was great, and so he sung it at Elgin and and won at Elgin. So although it came third place, and mm -hmm. 
1957 or whatever mm-hmm. that came first place in in 2024. So it's, that shows you the kind of uh, legacy mm-hmm. that the the song has. Mm-hmm. And um, like a lot of these songs, it, it was written to a sort of popular existing tune. Uh, we would mm-hmm. probably know it as the Road in the Miles to Dundee. Um, the song I just did a wee minute ago, Generations Change, kind of uses a similar tune as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Streets of Laredo, uh, which is a, a well-known American folk song. It kind of uses the mm-hmm. same tune too. Um, and yeah, we could mm-hmm. we could have a go at well, it. Well, we could just but, uh, finish on that one. <laughs> yeah. I'll sing ye a song Oh, a canty old buddy A kinspeckled figure Was old Watty Brun A trustworthy hand At the mains of drum cloddy Since the day he began to Work there as a loon and sign as a billy, he proved himself canny. His work conscientious, particular and keen. Till the day when his master said what he my money. You'll talk the third pair, the card princey and jean. Now in all bonny Scotland, there was ne a human. Say happy as what he we has done the pair. He shin held us in we the lave as a plumin, and oh he was prood o oh, his gelden and mare a fine pair of blacks neither like in a honour we caught so a rich glossy ebony sheen and that pluin matches for a years they were winners for grooming and harness were princey and jean knew what he I bided content we his duties but life's full changes as a body kens the crap at all the age claimed the twa his beauties and tractors began to appear at the mains. Do a steering wheel what he just would not be gripping. He rocked on his oar and lad did not complain. But Abedi noticed that what he was slipping, down hell he was pining for Prince and Jean. And knew he's a war, ah, his trachels are ended. A God fearing body, while I did his best. His life was a sermon, the mourners are kented. On choose the last week, when will lay them to rest? Now we all had a thought, though it did not divulge it. As we're hankies, we dab it. The tears fair in. If him who was born in a manger, say, was it, he'll be waiting for what he is, Prince and Jean. Oh, boy. <coughs> <coughs> 
here with her? Uh, man, 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 man. It's a, it's a real hot puller on the old heart oh, string. That's, so. that's a sad one. Aye, but you sing it so well and you do it great justice. What? And uh, I can only thank you for the bottom of my heart. Oh, the hurt me, but <laughs> <laughs> for joining us the day and and sharing so much of your knowledge and your wisdom and your talent with I, us is well, greatly appreciated. Thanks very it. much to yourselves. I uh, always enjoy having the crack with you, and uh, best of luck in the the future podcasts. Thank you very much, Cheers. Scott Gardner, Bothy Ballad singing extraordinaire. <laughs> Some thirty years sign to this parish I came, as a country reporter, the day was the same, on wildlife and fermin and Scottish folklore, but I can't know what work was till I joined out the doors. Fiona and Helen, well, the hushes guy sair. I seek in mere content to stop the eye player. There's whiles when their emails and tweets I ignores. You'll curse rural broadband if you work out the doors. We yoke at six thirty, sometimes it's still dark. We have breakfast all bacon served in the car park. We sausage black pudding and the porridge restores. Ten bob for your dung when you shite out of doors. I'm thorough to my stories and folkloric facts. Or oh, the woodsman, the stromness, the boatman of echt. And stirworms and brunies and maids on the shores. I seize them all daily when I gangs out the doors. There's whiles I'm in danger and bones I have broken. But I suffer in silence, there's ne'er a word spoken. On the ways of St. Cuthbert, West Highland John Muir's purple hearts are awarded when you risk out the doors. Now our engineer Ron, he's a first to the yoke, for he welcomes brief respite from travelling folk. Three lines in the sark and medieval bard core, while my mystery bird shoots the craw out of doors. Mark Stevens, your second, and a man for the hills, responsible access and land reform bills. Take your budget, the verse from him pours, like a poor man said scroggy, filling time out of doors, and spring me my fergie, I'll work till it's late, the hydraulics are slow like the lad in the seat. And the engine she whimpers while a Davy Brun roars. You do mear we a horse when you plow out of doors. So fair you will, Beach Grove, your car park a Jew. Likewise, Laura Guthrie and the aforementioned crew. Nae mair will you see me, nor I walk these floors. Mair stories to come when I've left out of doors. So I'll get in my booty and I'll sail for the sooth. And I'll think no upon ye, nor think on my youth. I'll search where there's kelpies, earth hounds and centaurs, and find the source of the devrin somewhere out of doors.